Welcome back students. I'm, I'm so glad that you have been following along with us in 1 Peter. We are continuing on through our study. If you'll turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to be in verses 13 through 21. And today we're going to talk about um, mainly one of the main themes in 1 Peter. And remember, 1 Peter is about believers living as, as sojourners, as as aliens in this world because one day we will have future deliverance. One day we will escape this world with all its sufferings and persecutions and trials and sin and one day we will live with Jesus forever. In First Peter is when he in First Peter, Peter was writing the letter encouraging them to rem, not just of that hope that one day they'll have future deliverance, but how they should live knowing they have future deliverance. So he also, he says, one day you'll be delivered to heaven and you'll live with Jesus forever. But he also says, how should we live in this world right now? And, you know, the past couple of weeks we've talked about how we are to live as God's children. We are to live as, as exiles, that, that we're not a part of this world and, and we, aren't, we aren't storing up uh, possessions here in a sense of living a materialistic lifestyle. We don't, we don't, we don't focus on the earthly. We need to focus on the eternal. And so as we've been reading through First Peter, we've noticed that Peter is trying to encourage his audience to live a certain way. So today is not going to be any different. Today we're going to talk a lot about submission, right? A lot about submission and, and submitting to authority. Not something that right now, especially in our political climate, you see a lot of people submitting to authority. You see a lot of people breaking the rules, breaking the laws. Um, you see a lot of uh, violent protests and looting and, and wanting to overthrow the government. You see a lot of those things. And, and so Peter says that's what's going on in the world. You see people hating one another, against one another, against the government, against authority. You shouldn't be that way. You should live differently. You shouldn't look like the world. You should look separate from the world. So look at verses 13 through 21. I'm going to read all the verses. And then I've got, I've got four, uh, three main thing, themes in this, three main points of emphasis that Peter wants us to know about submission. So verse 13 says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if you, when you sin and are beaten for it that you endure? But if, you, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to those who judge, to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So if you look at verses 13 through 18, Paul or Peter is going to tell us very plainly that we should have submission to authority figures. Look there at verse 13. It says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. No matter what in our lives when we when we come to government when we come to authority in our life the bible says that we need to submit to that authority 
I know that that's not normally what we see, but that's the whole point of Peter telling us to submit to government. We see in our world today that people want to overthrow the government. People don't like the government. People want to, they want to punish political leaders. They, they say foul things about their political leaders. But for the Christian, it's completely different. For the Christian, we are to live and to support and love our authority figures. Now notice I say authority figures because Peter doesn't say, well, just the government, just the president of the United States. No, he says all human institutions, all authority figures in your life. That means for you students, that means your mom and dad. That means your teachers. That means your pastors, your youth pastors, your leaders. The people in your life that have authority that God has given them, your call is to submit to them. Now, that's very difficult to do. It's not easy. But as a Christian, you are called to submission. And I think the beautiful part of this is when you do live a submissive lifestyle to authority figures, it shows others a testimony of Jesus. I mean, Peter tells us very, very plainly, Jesus never sinned. Jesus never did anything wrong. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus loved others. Jesus had not one ounce of sin. He did nothing wrong, but yet he was punished as a criminal. You don't see Jesus fighting back. You didn't see Jesus trying to overthrow the Roman government. Why? Because Jesus was focused on the eternal. In this first part of Scripture, verses 13 through 18, our call is to submit to authority. You know why? Because God gave us authority and government figures to to begin with. Government is a gracious thing given to us by God to establish laws. Could you imagine a world where there were no laws? God's given us government to, in order to, to punish criminals and to praise righteousness. Could you imagine a world where there was no one to enforce good, good laws in our country? So God has given us this as a graceful, um, um, graceful thing and to... To, to retain and, and draw back evil. If we lived in a world where there were no laws, no enforcement of laws, no one to, to help protect and punish those that, that have done wrong, sin would run rampant. No one would stop it. And so God has given us authority figures for a reason. God has given you parents for a reason. There's a reason that a six-year-old doesn't get to decide what they do with their life. Right? Could you imagine uh, when you were a little kid wanting to eat pizza for breakfast every day? There's a reason why God's given you people in your life to steer you into doing what's right. So parents, your youth pastors, your pastors, your, your grandparents, your teachers, there's people that God has put in your life to draw you and to steer you to a, a life that is, is a good life. And so Peter says, listen, God has given you government and God's given you authority figures. Don't disobey them. But second, he says, when you don't disobey and when you submit, even if they're kind of harsh or if they are harsh to people, people will look at your life and say, why do you submit to government when we don't? There's a big difference there. I remember I had a U.S. uh, US history teacher. He knew I was a Christian. And every day in U.S. history class, he would call me out to say, Ashton, what do Christians believe about this? Ashton, as a Christian, what do you believe about this? And there would be days where I felt like he was mocking me. There were days where I felt like he was isolating me on purpose. But you know what? My response to him wasn't, don't ask me questions. My response wasn't, "Leave, you know, I don't know, don't ask me. My response wasn't, I'll just sit here in silence. No, by the grace of God, I was able to answer his questions. Why? Because it was a testimony of number one, my respect for him, but it was an opportunity to show why I believed what I believed. That's the same thing when it comes to to government, when it comes to people in your life. You submit because it gives you opportunity to to share why you are standing standing on the gospel and you are submitting to the government. So it's a testimony of Jesus. Now there's times where, where we should disobey against the government. Right? We should disobey against government leaders. 
Not when there's a law passed necessarily that we don't like, raising taxes. Oh, I don't like that. Let's rebel against the government, right? Just because something like that is passed. But there does come a time where, the, where what legislation that's passed or rules that are passed, they, they infringe upon what the Bible says. And when that time comes, we civilly disobey. Think about, you can look this up, Pastor John MacArthur. Right now in the COVID pandemic, the state of California said, listen, John Mac uh, churches, you cannot meet. We don't care. You need to keep closed until we tell you that you can meet again. However, the bars were open. The, the, the malls were open. All these other places were open, but the churches were closed. People were able to go back to work. People were able to socialize and do other things, but they can't worship. That didn't make a whole lot of sense. So what did Pastor John MacArthur do? I mean, he said, we're rebelling against the government. We're going to open church, and we're going to have church. And they've been doing that for several weeks, and they can't fit in all their people. They've had to put seating outside their church. Why? Because they have stood on the Word of God even when the government told them what to do. So there is a time for civil disobedience. There is a time we say the government can't infringe upon the Bible, and we stand on that. But how we, do, how we disobey is important. We need to disobey with godliness and when and how the Bible tells us to. The second thing is this, is look at verses 19 and 20. So we, we need to submit to authority figures, but, but even when we submit, there's going to be times where we suffer for righteousness. Look at verses 19. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 19 and 20. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, that is a gracious thing in the sight of God. When we suffer for righteousness' sake, it is a picture of living out our faith regardless of what happens. I think of Peter and John in Acts chapter 3. They were beaten and persecuted for the fact that they were living out their faith. You know what happened? The Bible says after they were persecuted and beaten, they were joyfully walking home and thanking God for the fact they were counted as they were counted as worthy to sacrifice for the name of I mean, they were counted as worthy to be persecuted for the for the name of Christ. I think of that story and and I want Peter encourages us, listen, submit to government authority, submit to the authorities in your life even if you're beaten down because of the righteous life you're living. Keep going. Keep living in righteousness. Don't quit. And you know why? Because it points others to Jesus when you do that. It really does. It points people to Jesus. And people say, why aren't you rebelling? Why aren't you getting upset when they beat you for righteousness sake? And, they, and it's because that Jesus rules and reigns in their life and they want to live like Jesus. And it's such a testimony to who the Lord is. The last thing is found in verses 21 through 25. It says this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in His steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in His mouth. When he reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Be you were like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. Lastly, we need to remember that Jesus is our perfect example. We are called to suffer like Jesus. You know, um, what I, one thing that I do is um, whenever I'm trying to learn something new, I go to YouTube and I will we'll watch a video on how to do things. The videos on YouTube are great, perfect examples on how to do something. I don't know if you've ever done that. How to fix this, how to fix that, how to... How to do this on Microsoft Word, you do this, this, and this. And so you watch that on YouTube and you can learn to practice it. The same is true when we look to the Bible, we look to Jesus. No one is a better example of how to suffer for righteousness and have a testimony that points people to salvation in, in God. And so I want to encourage you, 
Stick around for the Q&A. Stick around for practical application because when you apply this to your life, you're going to have opportunities to live and be a witness for Jesus. All right, everybody, we are here for our Q&A and practical application time. Um, The first question is going to be for me. The first question is this, how does submitting to authority reflect the gospel? Well, I think the first thing that we need to recognize is, is we aren't called to, as I was teaching earlier, we're not called to rebel against the government. We're not called to overthrow the government. When we look to Jesus, Jesus didn't do that. Why? Because Jesus was focused more on the eternal rather than the earthly. Uh, the, the people at that time, the culture at that time was the Israelites wanted Jesus as the Messiah to overthrow the government and to set up his own kingdom and things like that. But Jesus said, I haven't come to set up a physical kingdom. I've come for a spiritual purpose, for a spiritual reason, and which Jesus went to die on the cross for our sin three days later be buried and raised to life. So I think when we ask ourselves, um, you know, how does submitting to authority reflect the gospel? We look to the life of Jesus and we say, if Jesus didn't do it, why should we do it? If Peter goes on to say, we're not called to overthrow the government. We're called to live a life of submission to God and to the authority figures in our life. We're called to follow Jesus. And when we do that, what happens is we begin to reflect the gospel with our obedience, our obedience to God and our obedience to authority figures. And people look at our life and they say, how and why are you doing that? And we have opportunity to explain why we do those things, right? And so I would say it reflects the gospel because it shows that we are obedient to God and we're obedient to the authority figures he's put in our life. And the reason for that is, is it brings glory to him and it's a witness to him that's as as easy and as simple um, as it can get so jay the next question is why is it important to look to jesus as the perfect example when it comes to suffering i believe it is important to look to jesus is because he is the one that we're following he actually called us to follow him and to um to actually be that um, light in in this world in which we live in. So um, it's very simple. I think in uh, verse 19 it says that for for this a gracious thing, when mindful of God, sorrows, um, when mindful of God, one endears sorrow while suffering unjustly. So uh, he tells us right here in this passage that um, to really endear suffering when 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 um living this life for christ and also he goes on to tell us in hebrews uh chapter 12 verse 2 uh to look to jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith for the joy that was set before him right um he endured the cross so if jesus himself um set set before him right the joy of going to the cross then we are we too should look forward to um you know suffering and um knowing that one day we will be glorified and um i believe that sums it up that's truly what the christian life is about it's not about everything you know going away jesus didn't promise to take our sorrows away um at least not on this earth um however if we truly follow him then he does promise us glorification and that that's what we should look forward to man what a great answer and and i'm just going to kind of uh the next question is kind of you know a little bit continuation of that the next question is what mindset should a person have when suffering for righteousness um you know in first peter in that passage it says what what does it matter if you suffer for sinning if you're beaten peter says beaten for sinning if you've done something wrong and you're getting you know, in trouble for that. What good is that? What true suffering is, is when you suffer for doing what's right. Um, I don't know if you've ever been falsely accused of something and someone says that you did something even though you never did it and you are innocent. There's nothing, you you feel so immediately like, no, I didn't do it. You're so adamant that, that you're innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. So could you imagine living a righteous life 
loving God, loving others. You're just seeking to make the gospel known. You're just living your life. And all of a sudden, people are burning down your home. People are wanting to persecute you and your family. You lose your job because you're a Christian. All these things start to be stripped away and you're suffering for doing what's right. How difficult would it be to have a, a godly mindset in the midst of that? Where we look to our suffering rather than what, what, what Jesus said to, to have joy in the midst of suffering and to remember our calling. And, and so Peter, you know, in this, Peter kind of tells us what kind of mindset should we have? The mindset that Jesus had. The fact that he was beaten and reviled and, and treated so horribly, but yet he didn't revile anyone. He didn't beat anyone. He didn't treat anyone with disrespect. No, Jesus set the example for us. He, his mindset was the right mindset, was that he, even though was being falsely persecuted and reviled and treated terribly, he never responded in the same way. He responded with love, responded with respect towards, with, uh, uh, towards others, responded with godly love towards other people and submission to authority. He didn't rise up. He didn't, he didn't attack, come off the cross and attack people. No. He laid down his life and he completed the work that God called him to complete. Didn't feel sorry for himself, didn't, didn't, didn't get beat down. No, he said, I have a mission from the Lord to do and I need to do it. I need to complete it. So that's the mindset we should have, the same one that Jesus had. We have a mission on this earth to make the gospel known. If we suffer for, for righteousness sake, then our mindset needs to be, I have, a, I have a purpose on this earth and I have future deliverance coming. I need to live to take the gospel forward and to make God known to the nations. So that's, that's how I would answer that question. So we are so excited that you guys have been a part of this time of Q&A and practical application. I hope you're enjoying the videos. Hey, if there's ever a time where you have questions, feel free to text me at 918-839-9199. You can text me. You can email us. Go to the church website, email us, message us on Instagram and Facebook. I mean, we would love to answer your any questions that you have um, that have to do with First Peter. We would love to answer those questions. And that's a place where you could interact with, with the uh, teachings as, as well. So we're so glad that you tuned in, and we hope to see you next week.